1943 white M16 half track. This is the A2 version. So the original version was produced and built right here in Ohio. Diebold Safe made the armor, BF Goodrich made all the uh, uh, rubber on it, and then the white truck company, of course, built the engine and, and the frame and, and everything else. So this was produced in 43, went to Europe. I don't have its service information yet from Europe. We're working on that on our research. In 1952, it was converted to an A2, along with uh, 413 others, and it was, they were sent to Korea to support UN forces over there against the human wave attacks. The uh, Korean history is, uh, it served from 52 to 53. It was given to the French uh, forces to go to Indochina at the end of 53. And in 54, the French pulled out of Indochina after they signed an armistice with uh, the, the Vietnamese. And it was sent to Africa with the French Foreign Legion. It served in Africa until the late 50s. It broke down and they dragged it out to the desert outside of an old airfield and left it sitting out there. I, was, uh, I worked in the spec ops community and was sent to uh, Africa on a mission. I had teams in uh, 14 countries and came across this thing when we were acclimating. We were, the heat there is incredible, so we would run like five miles every day trying to get used to the heat. And I saw this thing sitting in the scrub brush surrounded by thorn trees. So being a former armor officer, I had to go take a look at this thing. We went out there with a couple of my guys. We chopped into the bushes and found this thing sitting there. And I was able to contact the French commander uh, who I was working with and uh, we were friends and uh, I went ahead and purchased this from the French. I uh, paid for shipping it home in a container, shipped it to Norfolk, Virginia, and then uh, had customs go ahead and bring it in. Uh, that was in 2007. Now I served uh, and was wounded, so I didn't retire from the Army until 2011. So I never really got to work on this thing till I got, got home, and then I, my uh, work on it was interrupted because I went to Votec school for clock and watch making for two and a half years. Then we moved to Arizona. So actually, I've never really gotten to work on a thing till the past year. So we, it's a preservation project. As you look at it, it's completely original. There's, this is not a restoration. We're not sandblasting it, tearing it down. We're trying to preserve its history, the patina. So when anything's worked on on here, and I have to keep it original. I don't get to sandblast my parts and paint them and clean them. Uh, it's a little more challenging. But uh, the purpose, of course, and the end result speaks for itself. You know, the thing is, the thing is, in my opinion, it's it's a beautiful piece of history. Seen conflict, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, and Africa. So it's really a, a rolling piece of history. The uh, projects this year included replacing the track, which we got track from Israel. So you can imagine the the cost in, involved in that. And we are a nonprofit. We're an educational nonprofit. We're called the African Queen Project. That is the name of the half track, uh, for the obvious reasons recovered out of Africa. We uh, are an educational. Uh, we support STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. And what we're doing is we're looking at the engineering and the technology of the day when we talk about this, because this thing is phenomenal in its design. It has brass water pipes. Who puts brass water pipes in cars? Brass doesn't rust. Um, the electrical system was way ahead of its time. The turret, ballistically, is beautiful. It's same, very similar to the ball turret you find in the B-17, made by the Maxon company. The uh, wiring, everything, the, everything on the track works. The turret works, all the lights, everything, the brakes, all this has been gone through here in the last year, year and a half. So it's been an incredible amount of work and expense. Um, my wife will tell you about the expense, trust me. The, uh, the other thing is that, that we started our nonprofit this year too and, and, and uh, wanted to do something getting this out in the public. And this is a great start for us, being able to come to the National Museum of the U.S. Air Force. It's like a feather in our cap. We're very excited about this and very proud to be part of this. looking at a six-month loan right now and we may extend that depending on, on how things go. Uh, our fundraising right now is kind of 
we're kind of stymied because we're looking for corporate support. So with the COVID issue right now, like everybody else, we're just kind of putting things on hold. Getting this thing out in the public, and, and of course the foot traffic through here is phenomenal. COVID or not, it's, you know, you can't beat it. It's one of the best museums in the world. So we're really excited just to be able to have the share into that. It's a five-man crew, and I'll tell you, that's just getting in and out of this thing, it's a purple heart box. I, I, I bang my head, you pinch your fingers. I, you know, I can't, I, can't, I can't even begin to imagine in a winter, there's not even a personnel heater in this thing. In the winter in Korea, how cold it would have been in there with that steel and that metal. Um, they don't even have a tarp to go over the driver's compartment. So, you know, there it was no concept of really crew protection other than the ballistic protection that this, this armor gives. It's quarter plate and then half inch on all the door and window openings, hardened. I can't imagine the crews what they had to put up with. And uh, the guys in the back are called cannoneers. They actually used to sit on cushions on the floor. And then when they converted to, they actually put seats in there for them to sit on that fold up. But I couldn't imagine it. I mean, it's just, they're real heroes. Those people that served on this thing are real heroes. And uh, I, I really respect that. And that's another thing, we're, we're honoring veterans. We're, Overall, we're honoring those who served and made those sacrifices, and uh, that's still a great part of the United States, and I'm proud to say that people love our vets, and, and, and I see it all the time. I see it when you bring this thing out. A real opportunity to talk to vets. A lot of vets come up, and their dad served in them, or some I've had some World War II vets come up. Just been thrilled to see this thing. That's what we're after. It's an emotional recruitment. I'm, it's, we're not about the dollar. I am passionate about this. Bringing this thing home was like, I had to save it once I saw it. It was like, I gotta get this back to the States. And you know, there was a little bit of pain involved with that because of all the paperwork. And then once I brought it in, everybody and their brother was trying to grab it away from me that outranked me. As a colonel, would still outranked me. But the fact that I had purchased it from the French, no different than going to Germany and buying a car and shipping it home. We're allowed to do that, so that was my buy. That's, you know, that's how I got by because I had a contract with the French showing that I had purchased it. It was a pretty rough shape when I found it. There was no interior in it. It had uh, it had been all stripped and uh, partitioned between the gun compartment and driver. The French had cut it out to put a missile launcher back there. So I mean, I had the bones and I had the turret. So it's just building from there. So it's it's been a process. Biggest process is collecting the correct parts. Anybody that restores these would say that, you know, the correct parts and things that belong in there. Uh, when it shipped at Korea in 52. So that's what this is. Just right now is set up pretty much how it would have looked like when it went to Korea in 52. How does it handle when it drives? <laughs> well, the top speed is 45 miles an hour. And I gotta tell you, if you're driving 45 miles an hour and you're rattling teeth out of your head, um, it handles pretty well. The, the ride with the track is very good, especially on terrain, but on the pavement it rattles quite a bit. Uh, the fastest I've had it just to t test everything out was 30. And uh, I, won't go, I wouldn't drive it any faster than that. Generally I drive at 15 or 20 miles an hour, just out of respect for its age. It's you know, 77 years old, so yeah, it's, I don't want to beat it. Uh, I think it kind of, karma kind of comes back for you. So.